Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Hector. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, the, uh, since I have uh, uh, 20 minutes, uh, I thought that um, originally I wanted to talk about something uh, very different, uh, but then Dina Bitten, I don't know if Dina is here, uh, Dina Bitten encouraged me to talk about this topic, and I think what I'll do is uh, I'll speak for 10 or 12 minutes about this, and then uh, probably there is more interest in questions, so we'll leave some 10, 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, Steve mentioned HANA. Uh, actually, Stanford had a key role to play in HANA. Uh, Geo, uh, is Geo here? Geo is not here. Um, Geo, uh, back when I started at SAP, uh, so my, my work at Stanford and Geo was on my, on my PhD committee, um, but my work was in AI. And um, uh, when I started at SAP, it became very clear very quickly that SAP needed a, a new kind of a database because SAP's primary competitor, Oracle, which Hector used to be on the board of. Uh, are, are you still on the board? Yeah. Still, still I am, uh, still is. Uh, um, was also the primary provider of the database <laughs> for SAP systems. And so there needed to be a, a new database. So I, I called Geo and I said, Geo, this is the situation, and what is your advice? And Geo said, well, people are building next generation, second generation in-memory databases now. And he introduced me to one of his former students, Sang Cha, um, who I had not overlapped at Stanford with. And uh, uh, it took me three years to convince SAP to buy Sang's company, um, three years after that. And then there was an in internal group at SAP working on a in-memory columnar store. Um, and uh, after seven years of research to how to combine these and build a OLTP system that had the ability to do native, natively analytics on the same platform by taking advantage of these advances in hardware and so forth, we ended up building HANA. So people talk about HANA as a kind of an overnight sensation, but it took more than eight years of work uh, before we were able to release HANA. And, uh, uh, it would not have happened without Stanford. So after I left SAP uh, and started at Infosys, obviously Infosys is a services company, and uh, I started to look at uh, what is happening in the world of platforms and software, and it became very clear very quickly that there is a tremendous amount of energy that is going into open source uh, data platform so related work. And um, so we at Infosys have made a um, a very, very significant um, investment in this area. And I personally have come to the conclusion that uh, all serious platform work uh, going forward is likely to be open source, or at least a vast majority of it is likely to be open source. The sheer amount of work that is happening, when Facebook said recently that uh, last year they had 1,500 engineers that were working full time on open source. Um, and uh, so we at Infosys have launched a, a platform, we call this thing I. I'll quickly talk about the information part of it. You are all familiar with this. Um, various open source projects around various different layers of the information processing stack, starting from HDFS to uh, things like HBase, uh, as well as new uh, frameworks um, like Spark, and various libraries around Spark and other attachments around this infrastructure like Kafka and so forth. And our approach at Infosys is something that we call the Infosys Information Platform, is to embrace this and to take the open source components and assemble them into platforms. So we take the existing open source components, we create additional IP ourselves, whatever IP we create, we give that back into the open source community. For example, we have written a lot of different extractors, uh, which are now in open source. Uh, we have written the, a lot of the authorization. Uh, Abdul Razak is here. He is the head of the platform development work at Infosys. Um, we have written the, a lot of the authorization capabilities around Spark, which we also we have contributed. We have written a lot of drivers for connecting Spark to Tableau and other visualization tools, this is also in open source now. So we surround the open source tooling with other uh, componentry, um, packaging support, extractors, various kinds of engines and tools. We also have some 
very interesting investigative work going on, research work going on around, for example, integrating Monet, uh, which is an in-memory columnar engine, into Spark and into the, this Hadoop-based um, frameworks and so forth. And then we surround that assembly with uh, customization as well as uh, integration and implementation services. And there are the usual ones like data modeling, data cleansing, and so forth, and building algorithms and data science and these kinds of capabilities on top of the platform. But one key part of that is also the ability to customize. So there is a vast variety of software libraries now available, and we can customize these uh, for individual kinds of workloads and, and use cases. So the, this is basically our idea with IIP, we have close to 100 engagements. How many, Abdul? A little bit more than 100 engagements going on with, with our clients. Around this, where we build um, custom complex analytical solutions on top of that, whether it is around <coughs> forecasting the stock utilization for CPG companies or predictive maintenance on complex machinery or these kinds of scenarios. And uh, How do we get back to here? And this IIP itself is a part of a broader platform that we call I, <coughs> out of Aikido, uh, where we also include other capabilities around building AI solutions, uh, solutions for Internet of Things. This is what the AI stuff looks like. Uh, where there are a bunch of open source rule engines and machine learning libraries, the Stanford Natural Language Library, and things of this nature. <coughs> For Internet of Things, we have a specific collection of um, IoT-related libraries and so forth. So all of it is a, the idea of a platform is that it is a generic collection of these uh, components that we can assemble quickly into uh, use cases for customers. So you can even think of some of these are very, very large companies that we work with like Apple or Bank of America or Goldman Sachs or companies like this. And then you can imagine like Cloudera or Red Hat or companies like this take the open source technology and charge their business model is around charging maintenance on that. You can think of this as taking open source libraries, providing value added services around that, and then even maintaining these particular assemblies for clients for very long periods of time. So from a research perspective and from an ongoing technology development perspective, there are some very interesting challenges uh, that I want to mention that, uh, that we are working on. Obviously, this um, open design leads to some huge opportunities. The, the fact that it is open source, there is a deeply rooted openness in the architecture of these systems. There is also a tremendous flexibility. So I mentioned some libraries earlier. Uh, the traditional um, dimensions of data processing, whether it is uh, analytical dimensions where more and more complex analytics needs to be performed on the data or uh, high moving data with, with uh, uh, large event rates or OLTP rates, as well as the diversity of the data and so forth. Uh, there is a lot of um, diversity available in open source um, components that can be brought to bear for different kinds of problems. And also because it is open source, the cost of the software itself is nothing. There is no cost. However, at the same time, there is an ongoing cost of maintaining systems, the cost of change. There is a lot of concern, especially in the enterprise world, around the reliability of open source, security, um, and many of these kinds of resilience-oriented aspects of open source. And there is a unique opportunity that is emerging around optimization. So when I was at SAP, of course, the performance of HANA was one of the key things that we used to talk about. Um, and I have found that there is actually a, uh, a very interesting opportunity that is available in open source that we are working heavily on, which is to optimize the performance of open source systems after the fact while preserving their openness. So what if we could take open source software and treat it as a more or less as a specification, and then compile it while keeping the code the way it is, compile it down for either for workload-specific uh, areas or for different kinds of scenarios or even for individual kinds of hardware. There are now many different variations on, on infrastructure that are available 
um, around the kinds of interconnects between systems or there are new architectures that Intel has been proposing with uh, graphics coprocessors or even putting FPGAs right next to the processors on the motherboard where interesting variations can be tried. So what if we could take the open source code and compile that down into uh, specific hardware specific configurations and things like that. If we were to do that, we would get the benefits of, or if we could combine different open source components, like we recently tried uh, integrating MonetDB um, into Spark, and that gives us the benefit that for unstructured kinds of data, or uh, for this NoSQL kinds of scenarios, you can use Spark, but for the more traditional SQL, TPCH type scenarios, we can use uh, an in-memory columnar processor in MonetDB. And that to the extent that there are out of process penalties or the fact that Monet code base looks very different than Spark code base, we can actually do work on integrating these uh, after the fact by compiling the software better and, and things of this nature. Similarly, around security, we can perform after the fact hardening of the code base for specific kinds of cases around security. So if we, are, if we were able to do that, we would be able to keep the openness of the open source systems and yet bridge the gap between what enterprises look for. And I believe that in this lies a tremendous opportunity um, for, for research on how can we do these kinds of, uh, uh, bridge these kinds of divides where we keep the software open source, we keep the community's um, ability to, to work on it, uh, while at the same time we remove the gaps around performance as well as around around resilience and security. And in, in doing that, probably there are also business models that make sense for, for companies to follow. So we believe that over the next 18 months to two years, every one of Infosys's clients will adopt these, uh, this kind of an approach. And, uh, uh, and we are really excited about this. We think that there is a tremendous opportunity here, uh, not only to bring this kind of a platform into the, into the enterprise, but also then, of course, to build new kinds of solutions on top of that. So that is my main point that I want to make before I open it up to questions, is that modern information processing systems are all about, and, and the need for big data, the need for complex analytical solutions is continuing to increase, and that modern systems have to address this uh, end-user-oriented need for real-time decision-making. And um, with open source, with open data management systems, we have a unique opportunity to serve a wide range of scenarios. And increasingly, uh, people are making these open source based choices, even when there are commercial, commercial alternatives available, simply because once an open data management platform could be applied to a particular problem, the tra traditional um, proprietary software solutions are just not cost competitive enough or even cost performance competitive enough. Um, and we can do that with much better price performance and continuously leveraging the ongoing innovation that is happening. But doing this, of course, there is a, uh, there are many open issues uh, that need to be addressed, like, like some of the ones that I mentioned. And I think there is a tremendous opportunity here for uh, um, collaboration around research with especially with, with SDSI that we have been doing with ICME and, uh, and so on, but in general between companies and, uh, uh, and, and universities. So that was, that was my main point that I wanted to make and uh, hopefully there are some questions. Thank you very much. And thank you for agreeing to take questions. I know that uh, you have only a few minutes before you need to catch a plane. So thanks for squeezing this in in the midst of international travel. <laughs> Questions for Vishal? Yes. Uh, you talked about minimizing cost of test, uh, co I'm sorry, minimizing cost of maintenance, but then you also talked about uh, after the fact optimization and hardening, and I don't understand, doesn't that conflict with the ongoing maintenance if you have a separate branch that's optimized, hardened? I that's a, that's a great point. I think that the key is to not have a separate branch, but to have the compilation done as a after-the-fact thing on the same generic code base, to not create a new branch. So to um, think of it as custom compilation work that could be done that is specific to hardware infrastructure or that is specific to workloads, and, or you could just run the 
um, system generically and then uh, it is the same code base. So the code base is the same, but you write a, a kind of a additional compiler, compilers or optimization systems that take the same code base and then create optimized binaries for that to run on particular hardware configurations or for particular scenarios and things like that. If we were to create branches, then you would, uh, you are exactly right, then you create the maintenance problem. But the key to not getting there is to keep the code the same and stay on the traditional open source branch. Could it be a new version of one of those open source products comes out, do you have to then yes. change your you have optimizations? To, yeah, you have so. to change the optimizations then. You have to have the, that burden. And so this is the, in a package software company, this would be the traditional, the, the key question that you would ask is the cost of maintaining on, on an ongoing basis, keeping up with the changes that are happening in the open source world. And in a company like Infosys, I mean, there are, we have, it operates at a very different scale compared to a package software company. There are 140,000 engineers, software engineers inside Infosys. So one could actually, a lot of the business, I mean, uh, this has been a shock to me over the last 15 months. But one of the mainstays in the business is uh, maintenance of legacy code. 45% of our revenue, and in other companies, TCS and other companies, it is even more comes from maintaining code that is decades old. So this, ironically, being able to maintain optimizations for particular branches of code lines or for ongoing innovations is actually something that a company like Infosys can do. Uh, and so I think that this is something that we could even maintain individual optimizations for decades if we had to, because we have been doing that. So I believe so we have, I'm sorry, yeah. did I cut? No, go ahead. I believe we have time for one more question. Giraffe. Sorry, Vishal, this might take you back a little bit, but uh, you, I think I heard you say that um, uh, HANA is OLTP, and that, how does that lend itself to sort of deep analytical columnar style queries that are becoming increasingly common big data? So, so the, uh, I don't know what they have done to HANA since I left, so uh, my answer is based on what it was when I left and while I was still in charge. Um, the, uh, so the primary uh, data structure in, in HANA was a columnar store, and uh, the transactions would go directly into the columnar store. There was a, the work that Sang had done in his OLTP in-memory row store was more as a buffer that would sit in front of the columnar store in case the transaction rate would become so, so large that you couldn't insert fast enough into the columns, because inserting into the columns would require breaking down the schema into individual columns and, and so on. So, so the, the row would hold it as a buffer and then every once in a while you would do a, what is called a delta merge to merge it back into the column store. And then the, there are no update operations, it is an insert only design. Uh, so the update is done as a after the fact, uh, you know, you copy and then you replace and so forth. So be, with that we would get the benefits of full OLTP and we actually, um, in many ways, OLTP performance was also not only not worse than traditional OLTP systems, but because we were doing all of this in memory and, and because we had this buffering mechanism and for a few other reasons, the OLTP performance was more than adequate for our enterprise OLTP applications. Um, so now the benefit on, on analytics is that because the data is already, it's dictionary encoded and it is, it is columnar in nature, uh, you get the benefit of of really fast analytics because of that. Uh, so the design, it was designed in a way, traditionally what people do is you keep the OLTP database separate and then there is an in-memory columnar attachment, but HANA was an integrated OLTP analytics database. Please join me in thanking the shop. Thank you very much.